Welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started with this webinar. Um, it is one o'clock on the dot, so let's dive right in. I'm glad you could all be here this afternoon to talk about a really important topic. Um, I'm sure it's something that you're all gearing up for if you are a prospective optometry student as the application um, will open for next year's cycle before we know it. So that's coming up soon. Um, what better time than now to get some insight as to what you can be doing in advance of uh, the cycle or if you're a couple years out even from implying what you need to do to prepare to be a strong applicant. Uh, my name is Rebecca Griffin and I'm the Student Services and Admissions Officer at Southern College of Optometry. Um, throughout the presentation today I encourage you to type your questions into the question or chat box anything that pops up into your mind and I'm happy to field those questions. I'll try to do so as we go. Um, if there's any that I miss along the way, there will be plenty of time at the end of the presentation for me to address those then. So I want I have, you know, quite a bit of information to give to you in the presentation, but of course want to make sure that any remaining questions in your mind are answered. Um, I know that there's a lot to be thinking about and a lot going on. So please do, you know, share your questions with me or with the group. And without further ado, let's dive right in. Um, so obviously the top the topic of this webinar today is the application process. I'll talk a little bit about the timeline, as well as some tips that I have for you all to uh, submit your strongest application possible. Um, so in a brief nutshell, this is what the timeline for the application cycle looks like. So uh, the schools and colleges of optometry in the U.S. Uh, all use a centralized application system called OptomCast. And that system generally opens their cycle on July 1st of the year preceding fall enrollment. So if you want to start the program in fall of 2019, the application will open uh, for you this year on June 28th. So it can fluctuate a day or two, but we generally call it July, July 1. So this year, June 28th is when OptumCast will open. We align our application cycle with that date. Uh, so our application cycle as a whole at SEO will also be considered open on June 28. And the cycle goes all the way through until March 1. The end date of the application cycle is what you're going to see um, as the biggest variance between different optometry schools. So not every optometry school follows the same timeline. Uh, many of them have very different application close dates, so you'll want to be mindful of that. I threw in there when our interviewing starts as well, just to acknowledge the fact that we do have a rolling admissions process, as do many, not all, but many of the optometry schools throughout the country. Uh, so we start reviewing the applications that are submitted to our system when, when they are submitted in July and we look at those that are finalized, that are strong and competitive and start uh, in inviting students to interview as soon as August. Uh, we interview throughout the entire cycle until we fill our class and even at that point in time we continue to interview until we have a solid um, base of uh, an alternate list. So we usually do have some attrition for students who are admitted and we build an alternate list to be able to fill any vacant spots that open after the application cycle closes. So again that's the application timeline in a nutshell. And I see a question that has popped up already. The question is, how many students do you accept each year? And here at SCO, we accept 136 students. So um, it varies year to year in the number of applications that we receive. Um, in years past, we've received as many as 800. Um, in the last year, it was more in the realm of, of the 700 applicants for a total of 136 seats. Good question. All right, so um, I transition in the, in the presentation to next talk about what you can be doing at this point in time to prepare for the cycle, because there 
realistically is a lot that you can do in order to um, build your credentials and organize all of the information that you'll ultimately need to submit online through the application system. Um, so you don't necessarily need to or want to wait until July 1 to start getting things together. Um, the least you can do is be mindful of what it is you will eventually need to submit. So if there are things you want to be working on in advance, things you know that will take some time to gather or to build up the courage to, you know, reach out to your professors to ask, ask for references and so forth, um, things you can be doing now you want to be mindful of. So I have a short list for you here. I'll go into each one of these a little bit more in depth, uh, but just to start out, you definitely want to be researching schools, understanding what the field looks like in terms of options for optometry school, where those schools are located, what each program offers you, what their admissions timeline is, and what their credentials are in terms of average credentials for competitive applicants. Shadowing and work experience is an important part of the process that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. Of course, the optometry admissions test is a big piece to the puzzle as well. If you want to um, get into an optometry school, each school will require a score from the optometry admissions test by the time um, your application is, is submitted or um, rather by the time the application cycle ends. Um, the prerequisite courses, so the courses you need to be taken as an undergraduate student, you want to be mindful of how you're scheduling those, what are necessary, what ones you want to complete before you take the OAT, what ones you can wait and take as you're working on the application itself and so forth. Um, I have the, the list of prereqs on another slide in just a few minutes to show you. I mentioned reaching out to your references, something to be keeping in mind, and gathering materials and information that you will need to then put into the OptomCast system. Okay, another question that's come through. What happens if you submit your application before you've taken the OAT and or your letters of reference have uploaded their, their references? And that's a good question. So um, I'll go into the OptomCast application in a little bit more detail throughout the presentation, but as a quick answer, it is okay to complete the application in its entirety before you take the OAT because um, that will enable us to process all of the information you submit through your through OptumCast for your application so that your OAT score is the final piece of the puzzle. What you can do is, is if you are taking the OAT after you submit your application, take that piece of paper you get on your way out that has your unofficial scores, take a photo of it on your phone or scan it and email it to us. That way we can review your unofficial scores and render a decision on whether um, you're in invited for an interview with that initial information while we wait for the final scores to process. So that's okay. I'll talk in a little bit about, um, you know, what's recommended in terms of a timeline for when you should apply and when you should take the OAT. But in a quick answer to your question, you can take the OAT after you finish the application. You just need to submit your scores to us. And similarly with the letters of recommendation. All right, so let's dive right in. Um, first and foremost, I want you guys to really be thinking about the process um, as a whole. Um, and before you really dive into the nitty gritty, um, think about what you wanna get out of the experience of your optometric education. Reflect on what your goals are, what are your strengths and weaknesses and what you want to build up in yourself and really do some research in terms of what school is gonna offer you the experience that you need that's gonna allow you to be the best practicing optometrist or researcher or whatever your goals are um, that, that you can be. So you wanna take some time at the very beginning to start researching programs, comparing the programs against one another and against what your goals are and, and get a sense of what the differences are that each program offers. Like I said, um, there's quite a few schools of optometry across the country and many really great, excellent programs that will prepare you to be a great doctor. Um, so you need to figure out a way that you're going to differentiate one against the other so you can decide which schools you want to apply to. And that will inform your application of course. You want to, throughout the process, speak to what you know of the schools, demonstrate competencies, skills, and experiences that align with the goals of the institution or the mission of the institution. Um, so knowing what that is, again, is going to inform what you put in your application, what you talk about in your interview, the questions that you ask of the admissions officers, the students, the faculty that you speak to. 
And there's a lot of differences that exist between these programs. So um, looking at the, the schools, knowing if they're private versus public, um, single focus versus university setting or, or bigger, more comprehensive programs. Um, so here at SCO, we are a private school. Um, so we accept and um, consider equally students from any state across the US and, and even any country across the world. We're a single focus institution as well, meaning we only have our optometry program. Um, we do not offer any other programs of study, um, which lends to some strengths and some differences between schools, you know, other schools where their optometry schools are, are a part of a larger institution, a, a big research institution is an example where there are other programs that are offered on a master's or doctoral level. Um, you know, what the, the schools focus on in terms of being a really strong clinical program or research program um, is, is a difference, of course, with the schools you're looking at, you want to be mindful of what their retention and graduation rates are, what, you know, how many students are making it through the program from start to finish, um, what the board passage rates are, how well the schools are doing to prepare students to pass the boards that are necessary to become a licensed and practicing optometrist. And then naturally you want to consider the location, you know, how far you want to go from home, um, where each school is located and what the setting will be. So do you want to practice in a big city? where there are a diverse number of people um, that you're going to serve in the clinical part of the education or if you expect to be in a more rural setting as a practicing optometrist and um, what's going to get you where you need to be. Cost, of course, is a big factor and there's so much more to that. Um, I had a question come through. What are the board passage rates at SCO? Um, at SCO, we're actually really proud to have very strong board passage rates. So in the last year, um, our students had a 100% ultimate board passage rate. We're actually the only school of optometry who can say uh, for the last year that we had that 100% passage rate. The, the board exam is three parts. You start taking that in the third year of the program. Um, and some students, uh, you, you have the op option ability to take it multiple times. Um, and that's something definitely to be mindful of because you need to, of course, pass your boards in order to be a practicing optometrist and you want to know how well each school does to prepare its students for those boards. Okay. Um, so talking about the differences between schools, how are you going to know what the differences are, what the strengths and weaknesses are of each program? Of course, you can do so much research online, exploration on each school's website, um, but I encourage you to take it one step further and when possible, if possible, go and see the school, visit the school, take a tour so you can see what the academic facilities look like and what you what the clinical facilities look like too. Um, you can get a sense of what the population is that each clinical setting is serving, how many patients the students are seeing. You can talk to the students themselves and get a sense of what the experience is like from their perspective. Um, so if you can take a tour of the schools that you're interested in, um, that's going to give you the most intimate knowledge of what the school offers and how the students feel about the education and the experience they're getting at each school. You also want to know if, if you can live in the city that you're going to be living that you're going to be studying in for four years. So located in Memphis, um, we want our students to be excited about Memphis, to know that they're going to feel comfortable living here. So if you come down or over or up for a tour and you can, you have the freedom to take a couple days to get to know the city, do that. Um, you know, ask for recommendations when you go on your tour for places to go see, you know, Take a look at where the students are living, the areas of town, um, and that sort of thing. So you want to know that you can see yourself in the city that you'll be studying for the four years that you'll be um, in the program. And of course, you know, contact admissions officers, ask lots of questions. Um, I have the contact information for our office listed there. And note that if you can't actually physically come for a tour to our campus here in Memphis, we do have an interactive tour. Um, so it's not as comprehensive and you don't actually get to see, you know, the people out in the waiting room in our clinic um, or how, um, you know, the hustle and bustle looks like of our clinic and of our, our school each day. But it does give you a sense of what some of our facilities look like on that interactive tour. So it's the next best thing. Um, in researching the schools, of course, you want to get an a, a understanding of how competitive you are, how um, your credentials stack up to the other students who are enrolled in the program and who are applying to the school. 
Um, so this here shows you a snapshot of our entering class statistics for the last several years in chronological order. So you want to look at the bottom there for the most recent statistics of the incoming class. Um, so for the class of 2017, so our, um, our folks that started in this past fall term, they had a, an average GPA of 3.56 and an average OAT score of 331. And I know you're all familiar with GPA, but for those of you who haven't really dove into the OAT and understanding what that test looks like yet, um, for some perspective, the OAT is a test that's graded out of 400 points with the um, average score, they try to adjust so that the average score is around a 300. Um, so our average, and I should say 300 being the average for all test takers. Um, our average for our most recent incoming class was a 331. Um, and so as best as possible, you want to prepare yourself with that test to get as close to our average or to exceed our average. Um, what we consider as a competitive score would be a 320 and above, um, but we do consider scores that are 300 or 310 as well. Um, if you're in the 300 or the 310 range, um, the best chance you'll have is if your GPA is above average. So it's a little bit of a sliding scale. Um, you want to work for at least a 300 and at least a 3.0 GPA, but if one of your credentials is on the lower end, you want to make sure the other credential is above average um, to give you your strongest chance possible. This also gives you a snapshot of the number of students we've entered for the past several years and the number of applications that we've received. Um, we, we're just trying to finalize now our entering class for 2018, so take a look at those statistics when those are posted to our website. Generally, it's at the start of the fall um, because we do have some flux between now and when the program begins, um, but of course you want to keep updated on what these entering credentials look like. All right, and so I mentioned shadowing and working, experiencing the field. You want to get a sense of what the day-to-day -day looks like for an optometrist. Um, the only way to do that is to spend some time shadowing or working in the field. Uh, what we recommend at minimum is 30 to 45 hours of shadowing or work experience, and we recommend that you do that in at least two different settings, so at least two different practices. If you can get in three, that's, that's ideal. Um, we do that because, as you can imagine, each optometrist handles their day-to-day -day much differently um, from one another. Doctors do things differently and even different settings handle the practice and, and focus on different skills and different treatments and um, different technologies depending on the type of setting that you're that you're in. So you want to get a sense of how the field varies from practice to practice, from doctor to doctor. The only way to do that is to, to shadow at least a couple different settings. Again, three being ideal. If you can visit and see different scopes of practice, that's all the better. So as an example, if you go to a primary care private um, facility, you might wanna try a group practice the next time or a commercial practice or something more institutional like a VA. So if you can vary the scope of practice that you shadow within, um, that's all the better. We often get the question if oh, a job is necessary, um, you know, serving as an or a tech in a practice, and of course that's going to be great experience. Um, but it's not necessary, not all of our students, and, and probably not even the majority, come to us with having work experience that's paid in the field. And even if you do work in the field, we still want to encourage you to shadow in another setting at another practice or two. So again, you have that, that diversity and that experience in, in different modes of practice. No amount is too much, so get out there and shadow. Um, we say 30 to 45 hours at the minimum. That's what we feel is going to prepare you to dive right into the curriculum as a first year student and have some basic skills that you need for the lab. Um, but of course, the more you get in, the more comfortable you'll feel in the lab starting day one. Um, and the more you'll get to know where you see yourself, if you have a really strong interest in vision therapy or working with elderly um, or in a group practice versus, um, you know, a practice that you run on your own. Um, that's only going to help you develop your career from the start. I have some questions that have come through, so let's take a look. 
Um, when looking at GPA, do you just look at overall GPA or do you also look at each semester's GPA? Do you look at individual class grades? So that's a great question. We do look at all of your classes. So that's one thing that you'll submit via OptomCast is um, your academic information, your classes and grades to date, and then you actually have to submit your physical transcripts. So. The credential that we start with would be your cumulative GPA, and that's going to factor in classes you've taken at any institution as an undergrad or master's level student. So even if you've taken classes at different institutions, your cumulative GPA is going to factor those in. Um, so our standard credentials that we look at, um, the big three that I like to call them are your cumulative GPA, your OAT score, and your experience in the field. Um, we will also we will also calculate a prerequisite GPA. So we pull out all of the classes you've taken that we will count as your prerequisite courses and calculate an average GPA on that. So that's another big um, piece of the puzzle. But we will also look at trends in your grades. So we'll look to see if you failed any classes, if um, you maybe have a lower GPA, but you've improved it in the last you know, a couple of years, um, and you're in A's and B's, or all A's student toward the end, we will keep those in mind. So we do see each of your individual classes. Um, another question in the same vein, uh, there are some courses that are more difficult, like upper level courses, especially biologies. How do C's look on a resume? So what I like to say is if your GPA is, is within the range of our average, so a three, five-ish or above, you know, 1C is not going to hurt you. If, if you're generally an A's and B's student, 1C, again, is not going to hurt you. Um, if you have a lower GPA, you're in the 3.0 range or below, um, then it, depending on your OAT score, we might recommend that you retake or take a couple of new classes. So it's, it's going to depend on the strength of the rest of your application. It's hard to really judge and say um, that a single GPA that is maybe a 2.9 is going to make it or break it. So we have to see that in conjunction with the rest of your application. We will accept C's and we, you know, we accept many students who have some C's on their, their transcript. And especially if, they're, if you're generally not in the C range or D range and you're generally A's and B's, generally, um, you know, 3.5-ish student, a couple lower grades is definitely not going to hurt you. All right. What is the lowest GPA accepted? Uh, we don't really have a hard minimum for this score. I've mentioned 3.0 a couple times. That's really what we consider to be minimally competitive. Um, we have interviewed students who have been slightly below 3.0 before, and especially if they've knocked the OAT out of the park, um, we would consider a lower GPA. A question about shadowing. Is that 35 to 45 per optometrist shadowing or uh, total? for the minimum um, per opt, excuse me, is the 35 to 45 per optometrist shadowing or total for the minimum? So that would be total. Um, so at least 30 to 45 hours in total for shadowing. All right. Um, so let's, I have a, another slide I wanna show you about shadowing before we move on. Um, so I mentioned different modes of practice, um, just to acknowledge what different modes of practice exist out there. Um, we have what, you know, a lot of us have experienced when we go in to see our optometrist, prim primary care, um, private facilities, um, like this Midtown Eye Care Center that you see here. Um, I mentioned commercial practices, so some that you'll see that have locations across the country, um, Lens Crafters being one of them, or more institutional setting like our Eye Center, which is a huge um, operation and, and might be physically located amongst other healthcare professions. So um, it's not necessarily one being better than the other. Um, we definitely want you to have varied experience, again, so you can evaluate for yourself where you see your Yourself going and also you can talk more to the differences across the field and be more educated about how practice looks different in different modes of practice. Um, definitely private practice is, is where most optometrists are employed um, so you want to spend some time in a private practice certainly first and foremost. 
Um, a couple more questions about shadowing, planning to shadow an optometrist since this summer and may continue to shadow after I send in my application. You can update your OptomCast file after you've submitted it to put more information in. And even if you get to a point where OptomCast is cutting you off, you can always email us that information and we can add it to your file manually. Question about shadowing an ophthalmologist. When we talk about our shadowing minimum, that 30 to 45 hours, we really want that to be an optometrist. You can put ophthalmology um, shadowing on your application, and to some degree, it will acknowledge that you have some varied experience in healthcare and you can understand the differences between those practices. So I would say put that on your application, but make sure you're still getting to the minimum number of hours with opto um, shadowing optometrists specifically. All right, and a question about how the, the question is, I was reading about how the GPA was standardized for optometry school admission. Can you explain this? Um, I think I understand where you're going with this question. Um, what happens when you submit your application through OptomCast, which I have a couple screenshots to show you in just a minute, um, you will actually go in line for line and put all of your classes in there for anything that you've taken at any institution as an undergraduate. And then OptomCast will calculate your GPA for you. So we don't actually look at a cumulative GPA that's reported um, on your transcript by a single undergrad institution. Instead, we look at the, the GPA that OptomCast calculates. So I think that's what you're getting at with the standardized um, GPA because it includes all of your classes at any institution and is calculated by OptomCast. Um, a question about prerequisite courses. Um, I'm going to get to that in just a minute. So let, let me just dive right in and, and actually keep going. So here's prerequisite courses. Um, so these are the courses that we, we require students to have taken by the time that they start the program. They're pretty on par with what most optometry schools and what actually a lot of professional healthcare programs require. Um, so naturally, we have a lot of science classes that you are asked to take to prep you for the curriculum that you're going to start with here year one in the program. In addition to some of those science classes, we require a couple semesters of English or a year of English, a general psychology class, uh, two semesters or one year of social science, and that's a little bit broad. I get this question a lot, what is, what is considered social science? Uh, standard social science would be things like um, political science, religion, sociology, social work, um, even econ. Um, so those are the classes you want to be working toward, um, geography even. Um, we tend to be a little loose in our interpretation of social science and um, we sometimes will, will count like a, a history class or something along those lines as well. Um, we require one statistics course, one calculus course, and then for the sciences, you can see there, general biology is with labs. Those can be classes not necessarily titled biology one or biology 100, but any general or introductory level biology class. So it could even be anatomy or anatomy and physiology, that sort of thing, so long as those classes included labs. Um, microbiology with lab, one course. General physics, two semesters with labs. General chemistry, two semesters with labs. Organic chemistry with lab, one course. Um, note that some programs do require two. We require one, though we do strongly recommend taking um, the second semester. That will help you in preparation for the OAT as well in many cases. And then biochemistry would be the last. And so in regards to prerequisite courses, uh, what you want to keep in mind is, is what the what you'll need to take to prepare yourself for the OAT first and foremost. So the OAT includes um, different sections, um, general biology, general chemistry, general physics, organic chemistry, quantitative reasoning, and uh, reading comprehension. Those are the sections of the OAT. So naturally, in order to give you time to um, take the classes, prepare for the OAT, and submit your scores, you don't want to be taking your general physics classes in your senior year if you want to start the optometry program the following fall because you're not going to have that knowledge in order to take the OAT in time by, by the end of the application cycle. So you want to focus on those general sciences and organic so that you have that knowledge. You also have some time to prepare for the OAT and to take that test before the application cycle opens or um, at the beginning of the application cycle. 
you can be taking and finishing prerequisite courses as you work on the application. So even if you submit your application in August, you can be finishing calculus or statistics in the fall and in the spring and even in the summer. So our standard is that you complete successfully all of your prerequisites by the time you start the program in the fall, um, which means you can be taking some of those classes over the summer. Um, I think that might have answered some of the questions. So it doesn't, it does not harm your application to not have completed all of the prerequisites. It's very common that we have students who are completing biochemistry, microbiology, um, statistics sometimes as they are working on the application and even after they've been admitted. Okay, a question about the social sciences. Do you want two of the same courses uh, for two semesters or can it be one geography and one semester and sociology for the next? So with any of the prerequisites, it's not required that it be a progression. Um, and for the social sciences specifically, they do not need to be the same topic. They don't need to be, um, you know, religion one and religion two. Um, it can be very different classes in very separate semesters. Good question. All right. Uh, reference letters. So another important part uh, of the application. At SEO, and this is going to vary from school to school, uh, but here at SEO we require two letters. One from a non-relative optometrist, so not father, not uncle, not cousin, um, that you have worked in sh or shadowed for. And one from either a pre-health advisor or pre-health advisory committee or a professor in biology, chemistry, or physics. So that one's a little bit broad. Um, make sure it is not just any, any professor, you know, it has to be prof a professor of biology, chemistry, or physics if you are taking that route. So only two letters. You can submit more than that and we will review those. So we will review any letters that you submit via OptomCast. I believe the system allows up to four, but all we require are those two. What you will do in the system is submit the contact information for the professor or person, doctor that you are requesting a reference from, and they will get an email with instructions as to how to go into OptumCast themselves. Um, they fill out a little bit of information on the system and then they upload a letter. So if you're reaching out to your references in advance of the, the cycle before you start the application, you can just give them a heads up to say that, hey, you know, I'm wondering if you're willing to submit a reference letter for me. I'm applying to this school. I'm really excited about it and I really appreciate your support. Um, the cycle will open around July 1. I hope to get in there and um, do what I have to do so that you get the request, you know, at by the middle of July and what you'll need to do is upload a letter so that way they know a letter is what's going to be asked of them and they can work on that letter um, even before they get the request so again two reference letters that you will request via OptomCast um, like I said you can submit additional letters but don't go too overboard um, you don't want to you know water down to really great recommendations by having um, you know more from your um, your supervisor of the ice cream scooping job you had in high school or, or something like that. Of course, it's good to know that you have good um, experience, you know, strong work ethic and so forth, but we're really just looking for um, those two reference letters or maybe, you know, a third and fourth at the most. And then another part of the puzzle that you can be working on in advance is um, ref a reflection on the essay question that you'll be asked. This one is specific to SEO, so this will be a part of the process that you might need to customize from school to school if you're applying to multiple. Um, so take a, a second and read this essay question. Um, we want you to des describe what inspired you to pursue optometry, any kind of um, experience you've had in the profession, um, Again, you don't need to go into really strong detail about your shadowing. There will be a separate section for that, but um, note what experiences you've had that have been impactful in your journey to this point. Um, you know, what mot motivated you, what led you down this, this path, um, and what you hope to do in your future with that. Um, we want you to limit that to 4,500 characters. So it's not a 
you know, it's definitely not a novel that we want you to write. It's, um, it's a pretty straightforward prompt. And it's not something I want you to stress about either. So this is not something that will really make or break your application. Um, we will look at your credentials, we'll know about your aptitude um, through those more statistical considerations. And this is just a chance for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself so we can get to know you a little bit more, understand what led you down this path um, and what excites you about the field and what you know about the field. This is really, um, a way for us to, to um, again, get to know, to know you. And the only way this could really make a huge impact on your application is if we see any red flags. Um, if we note anything we would be concerned about, or perhaps as simple as um, not really talking to a large degree about optometry, which, which seems um, obvious, of course, but we have had some students who have talked about um, all the things that they tried that they didn't like that inevitably led them to optometry, but didn't focus on what about optometry specifically was, was interesting to them. Um, so this is a prompt you can, again, um, take note of and start reflecting on, may, maybe making a draft so that when the application opens, you can just copy that over from your Word document or wherever you're saving it into the system and be ready to go. Um, a question about the essay question, is this different from the personal statement? Um, and are the interviews closed, only reading the personal statement essay? So this is the only prompt, the only essay question that we ask of you. So this is essentially the same thing as your personal statement. Uh, and the way our, our interview process works, um, the admissions team has access to your file and can read your response. Um, when you come for your interview, you will sit through a conversation. The technical interview portion of the day will be with a professor, and it's a blind interview. So they do not have your file. They do not know anything about your background, and they do not have your prompt to your essay question um, or your response to it. So um, they just have your name. They know the state that you're from, and you get to sit down. They'll ask you questions. It's pretty casual, um, pretty conversational, and you'll... Um, you'll be asked questions and um, you'll want to, in that conversation, be able to talk to the same sorts of things. So what led you down this path? What moments in your journey were, you know, transformational or inspirational or, you know, confirmed your interest in this field and what you know about the field to some degree. So the legislative, legislative aspects of it, some of the challenges of healthcare, so on and so forth. So, um, so yes, the technical interview with the professor, they will not have this information, but the admissions team will, and you will engage with the admissions team and an admissions counselor during the interview as well. All right, so let's say you take the next couple months, you're prepping for the OAT, you're taking the OAT, you're putting your information together, gathering your transcripts, you have your prereqs all planned out, you're ready to go. Um, when the application cycle opens, you'll wanna make sure you understand exactly what you need to submit. So um, it is two applications that you'll need to work on. The first I've mentioned many times already, so OptumCast. Optum CAS centralized application system. So this is where you are filling out one application and you designate the schools you want to have access to your information. So um, any school that you want to apply to will be able to see the same information you submit to OptumCAS with, of course, exception to those um, individualized pieces like our, our essay question that we ask of you. Uh, and so the second part of the process is the SEO supplemental application. And this is a pretty straightforward, simple form you fill out on our website. I took a screenshot here. You can see the yellow apply button in the top right corner. This will lead you to this how to apply page um, and you'll find the link to apply there. So the application lives on our website. It too will open on June 28. So the same timeline as the OptumCast cycle. Uh, and it's it's pretty general information, background information, um, you know, if you have any family members who are optometrists and what your name is and what school you went to and um, so on and so forth. You will need your OptumCast ID number in order to submit your SEO supplemental application. But aside from that, 
These are completely independent forms that you can work on independently and you can submit in any order. It does help to submit your supplemental application as soon as possible and it is a simple form you can do in, in maybe 10 minutes because we receive the information and we start a file for you after getting your supplemental form. And if you have your GPA and if you have your OAT score, um, we could give you some feedback right then and there, you know, once we've processed your file. So if your credentials are looking a little bit lower than what we consider to be competitive, um, we would reach out to you and give you some feedback to say, oh, we really need you to increase your OAT score by 10 points or something along those lines. Um, but otherwise, these, these processes are, are pretty independent. Um, I have a little bit more information about the OptomCast application, since that's where you're really going to submit the meat of your application. The majority of your information is going to be on OptomCast. So this is a screenshot after you start your application online of, of what you'll need to do. It's pretty user friendly as a site. There's four different main sections you can see here. Personal information, academic history, supporting documents, and then program materials. That program materials section is what where you're going to find the individualized requirements for each school you're applying to. So what are those sections include? Um, so personal information is pretty straightforward. It is as it sounds, demographic information um, by and large and a, a release statement. Your academic history is where you'll go in and class by class and put your information from your undergraduate studies. There is a system that OptomCast offers. You can send them your transcripts and pay a little bit extra to have them put in your transcript information for you. We generally don't recommend that because it does cost a little bit and it takes a little bit more time for them to process than if you were to do it yourself. So we recommend just getting a copy of your transcripts sitting there and spending, you know, however long it takes to, to input that information yourself. What happens after you submit your transcript information to OptumCast, you do also need to send your physical transcripts to them at OptumCast. They will go through a process to review your transcripts against what you put into OptumCast and verify your file. That can take several weeks and we are not, nor are any other optometry schools allowed to invite you for an interview until your file has been verified. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. You want to give yourself time and don't expect to be able to submit your information in a day and get an interview invitation the next day. There is a little bit of a gap that OptumCast needs to receive your transcripts and verify your file. We can look at your file, we can give you feedback on your competitiveness and let you know that, hey, we're really interested in you, we see great things in your file, and we will be ready to invite you for an interview once your OptumCast file verifies. We can give you that sort of feedback, but we can't officially invite you until that happens. Um, supporting information is where you will submit your evaluation requests, so your letters of reference will go in there, as well as your experiences. And experiences is a, an important section and it's pretty broad. In that section, you'll put any kind of work experience that you've had, whether it be related to the field of optometry or not. You put any kind of extracurricular experience you've had at your undergraduate institution, as well as your shadowing hours. And we don't want you to skip any of these sections. When we look at your file, we're looking for someone who's well-rounded, who demonstrates an interest in, um, in optometry, but also um, in, in their passions more generally speaking. If you have an interest in volleyball or board games or um, politics, uh, we wanna see that you take those interests and you pursue them. We also want to see that you have the ability to, to balance a lot, that you can take classes, be successful, and handle extracurriculars or work on top of that. Because the program here at SEO, as um, it is true of other schools, it is pretty in intensive. You start in your first semester with 24, 25 credit hours. So it's important that we see students who we feel will still be able to excel in, in um, such an intensive environment. Uh, we also have 
uh, as part of our mission statement, uh, strong value for service. So we want to know any kind of service experience that you have. Um, the field of optometry um, is all about serving your community, serving the people in your community, being involved in the profession to advance it, given the legislative nature. Um, so we like to see students who have been involved in service to date as well. The program materials, once again, is, is the individualized um, school's requirement. So mainly for us would be your essay in that section. And then I have noted the cost for each application. So for one school, 170, and then it goes up from there through OptumCast, $70 for each additional school. Um, something to be mindful of, be budgeting for, and be prudent in the schools that you're selecting. Um, it's, it's not as easy just to apply for all schools at once. It's really going to rack up the cost there, so something to, to note. The supplemental application, again, demographic and just basic information, and there is a, a $50 application fee that you would pay online. All right, so... Um, couple questions. So I am an athlete at my university and don't have a ton of time for many other clubs. Is being an athlete very beneficial to my application? Definitely. That's one of the things that we we totally recognize as being, um, you know, something that requires time, requires you to be diligent um, and to balance quite a lot. So again, it, it's not necessary that you do something specific, that you're involved in pre-optometry club and you're working in the field and you're um, volunteering every Thursday. We just want to see that you have interests that you pursue. So yes, athletes, um, we definitely recognize that as a very strong um, credential, a good um, demonstration of your ability to handle a lot. All right, um, you have to send transcripts through the mail. Um, generally, I believe that's something I, I would need to double check. I'm, I'm pretty certain that you do send your official transcripts through the mail or if you have the ability to request an official electronic transcript, I believe OptomCast will accept that as well. Um, I, I would need to double check on that specifically, um, but as long I do know that it needs to be an official transcript, so it will depend to some degree on what your institution can send, though I, I believe many or most undergraduate institutions are able to issue official transcripts in an electronic form nowadays. And then a question, does it look worse if you only apply for one school? Should you apply for more even if you um, don't have an interest there? We really don't factor that into our review of your file, how many schools you've applied to. Um, and I don't believe we have the ability to see the schools that you've applied to either. So we really wouldn't know unless you told us the schools you're applying to. So definitely I wouldn't worry if you have one school in mind um, and you're pretty sure that you will have a strong enough file to get in. Um, you can apply to just one school. Of course, you know, you want to weigh for yourself um, whether you want to put all your eggs in that basket or you want to have a backup plan. And uh, this is an overview of the admissions process as a whole. Um, so you saw the timeline and these are the steps that work into that timeline. Uh, so first and foremost, you're submitting your information online and I mentioned that the OptomCast system has to verify your file. Um, we process your supplemental application and collect your supporting documents um, and take a look at your transcripts. So that's all kind of what goes into the application process online in general. So step one is on you. Um, step two is on us. We review your application and consider you for an interview. If we get a completed file, a verified file that has an OAT score and it is competitive for an interview, we would reach out that same day or shortly thereafter with an email invitation to join us for an interview. Our interview days at the beginning of the cycle, generally August and, and September, will be on Mondays and Fridays. And from that point moving forward are generally just on Fridays. So we would offer you a few different dates to choose from and you would call us to schedule your interview. Um, you come to campus for your interview. It's required for everyone to be here in person. It's a half day. I mentioned that you do have a conversation with the faculty member as your the technical 
portion of your interview, you meet um, with an admissions officer to take a look at your file, make sure we have everything we need from you. We ask you any questions that we have. Maybe you did struggle in physics too and you got a C or D, we might ask you what happened. Um, or if there is something interesting about your background, we might just chat with you about that a little bit. We're just trying to get to know you a little bit more and answer any uh, questions that you have as well about our program. Um, if you have questions about not only the admissions process, but the program itself, the student life, housing, anything like that, we give you the chance to ask us all those questions. And then we do meet after the interviews pretty quickly, um, generally within a few days, and we try to render decisions within about a week or two after you come for the interview. Um, and so it's a pretty quick turnaround, generally within a week, but sometimes it can take just a little bit longer depending on the, what's going on in the year. And if you apply early, we give you lots of time to think things over, um, so you get eight full weeks um, to decide. Um, if you're applying a little bit later on, after November, it starts going going down from there, but applying early gives you that that good eight weeks of time to, to consider things and, and make your decision. Um, I want to make one quick note about contract seats and scholarships, um, because this is an important piece to the puzzle that um, we get questions about often. So competitiveness is important for admission, but also for your um, selection for funding. We have two different types of funding for incoming students that are, are um, grant-based. Of course, we have financial aid as well, but in terms of grants, we have um, contract seats. We have funding that's been given to us from these particular states that I have listed here. That funding is given to us so that we can subsidize tuition for those students. Uh, we have a limited amount of funding um, from each state for students from those states, so we can't award um, contract seats to every student who applies in, in some cases. Um, but if you were to look on our website, you see two different types of tuition listed. So non-regional would be our standard tuition from students from any of the states not listed here. Regional tuition is going to be dependent on the state for, for anybody who falls within these nine and is competitive. Um, so as an example, I think Arkansas, we made it maybe had six seats this year. Um, and so applying early on is going to mean that um, you're being considered first and foremost for admission, but also for these contract seats, this regional tuition for a select number of students from these states. Um, you have to be able to certify your residency, so you have to be able to prove to the state itself that you are a resident in order to be eligible for these contract seats. Um, we don't need a separate application from you. Uh, all you need to do is submit your standard application. We will assume if you're a student from Georgia that you want to be considered for a contract seat and consider you um, likewise. Um, so for scholarships, it's, it's similar in nature. It's merit-based. Uh, we don't require a separate application. We would judge you based on your standard admissions file. We have over 50 endowed scholarships that we offer for the entering class, and they range anywhere from $1,000 to $20,000, and that's a per student per year basis. We generally try to prioritize students who are not eligible for contract seats when it comes to scholarships so we can give as many students funding as possible. And then I want to get into some tips and then I'll get back to the questions that have been posed. Um, so tips, apply early. Early application, uh, we generally mean August, September into October. And I've alluded to the reason for this. We have a rolling admissions. So applying early means you're applying when we have the most spaces available, the most contract seats, and the most scholarships available. It also allows you to um, make any improvements in your file that are requested of you. So if you submit your application, or, or perhaps if you come for an interview and we feel like there's an area that we really need you to, to develop before we can accept you, maybe we want you to do a little bit more shadowing or we need you to improve your OAT score by 10 points or what have you. Applying early gives you time to make those improvements and come back to us before we filled our class um, or before we've you know, given away all of our scholarships, so on and so forth. So um, it gives you that buffer to still get your application in in a timely manner if you need to make improvements, re retake the OAT, et cetera. 
So that's tip number one. Um, definitely try to apply early if possible. Um, tip number two, connect with optometrists, connect with optometry schools and students. Get as much feedback about the field, about the process, about the schools, about the experience as you can. So you know, um, you know, you know more about the schools, you know more about the experience and where you want to go. Uh, you want to spend adequate time preparing for the OAT. OAT is a very important piece to the puzzle. Um, and you want to make sure that you're getting ideally above a 320 or in the 300, 310 range. Um, and similarly to what I was saying about applying early, you want to factor in potential time to retake, especially if you're a person who uh, struggles maybe with standardized tests and you, you feel like you're going to want the chance or you might need the chance to retake, you want to budget that into your timeline. You want to make sure that you are acting professionally throughout the process. So anytime you email us, you call us, uh, make sure you're, you're using your professional etiquette, you're um, addressing your emails, you're writing in, in full sentences um, without, you know, text language and that sort of thing, uh, because you are applying to professional school and, and we want um, to start to um, to see your professional skills, to know that you, you will act appropriately as a doctor and even as a student here. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but want to reemphasize that you demonstrate knowledge of the school you're applying to. So in the application, in your essay, and, and when you come for an interview, know what it is that we um, are all about. Know, read our mission statement. See that we have a, an interest in service and a value for service and um, you know what we consider to be the strongest points of, of our, our program here. So you can reiterate those in your interview, ask questions, and know that you're, you're the right fit for us here. And, and once again, ask questions, prepare questions. So prepare questions for your interview. You can ask intelligent questions to the faculty who are interviewing you and to the admissions officers and even to the students that you engage with while you're here. Um, and keep in touch with us. We are here to help you if you have any questions along the way, um, or you need more information, or you, you even want to know if some of the classes you've taken um, will count for our prerequisite courses, or um, you want to know if your GPA is strong enough, or um, anything like that. You can always reach out, and we're happy to give you feedback. All right, so then that brings us to the end of what I prepared. I do want to get to the questions because I see quite a few here. So I'll work through these questions and try to get to them. Um, anybody else out there who has questions, please go ahead and chat those into the box. Um, quick note that I am recording this session and I will post this to our YouTube page if you want the chance to revisit this or uh, maybe you have to run, but you want to hear what the other students' questions are, you can um, see the recording on our YouTube page as well as recordings of all of our previous webinars from the year. And here on, on the screen, you'll see our upcoming webinars. We're coming close to the end of our webinar cycle for the year, uh, but we have one more in May that our Director of Admissions, Mike Robertson, will do. So if this is not your first time applying to SEO, um, but you're reapplying and you want to know some tips to boost your chances to better your application, it'll be a good one to tune into. And a quick note for everybody, um, I will participate in the ASCO virtual fair in June. This is a chance for you to engage with admissions officers and faculty from many of the schools and colleges of optometry. Um, it's a virtual fair, so it's, it's essentially a chat box um, that you'll be able to, to visit. You can see other people's questions and ask your own and um, get to know a little bit more about each program in that way. Um, so I encourage you to attend the ASCO virtual fair and you can find more information about these events on our website or you can email me or call me anytime. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of these questions. Um, so going back to the top, I see another question about prerequisite courses. Would Greek mythology count as a social science? I tend to think that yes, that would probably um, that would probably count for a social science. So I, I think that one's good to go. Uh, let's see. Um, is foreign language? A uh, social science generally not, um, generally not foreign language for social science. So that's a good question though. All right, a question about shadowing. Will it count if I shadow two optometrists? 
but in the same physical location. Uh, generally, we do consider that to be two separate experiences, but we would recommend um, getting more experience in, in a different practice. So ideally different practices that we would consider separate experiences, those that you have with different doctors within the same practice. <clears throat> Uh, the question, um, how many or what percentage of people that apply do you invite for an interview? Um, that's a good question, and I don't have the, uh, an exact statistic on that, but um, I, I would like or venture to say that we interview in the 200 range. Um, so 200 or so students. Um, we interview for a total of 136 seats. So generally, we're only bringing in students who um, are being strongly considered for a seat here. Um, let's see. A good question. If you are an out-of-state student the first year, are you able to become a resident of the state to be eligible for in-state tuition? Um, since we're a private school, we really don't have in-state or out-of-state tuition. So we, there is not a possibility to get in-state or what we call regional tuition after your first year. Um, so that's why we really focus a lot for students who are outside of the region on scholarships. And we do award over 50 scholarships that can range up to $20,000 per year. Um, so we have a very healthy scholarship program and a very strong financial aid office and st strong financial aid program to help students who do not qualify for regional tuition. Another question about scholarships. Do you find out if you receive a scholarship when you receive your acceptance? That's a great question. Uh, you generally do not find out about scholarship in that same phone call, uh, but you will always find out whether you've been awarded a scholarship within the time that we give you to make your decision. So we're not going to force you to make a decision before knowing if you've received a scholarship. And generally, it's within a couple of weeks that you hear back about scholarships. Question, how many times can we apply for SCO? Uh, we don't have a limit to that. Uh, we don't carry over any kind of application materials from one year to the next. So we essentially wipe your slate clean if you are uh, reapplying to the program. Um, there's a question about the maximum amount to take the OAT. I'm not sure amount of what, but if, if I assume you mean the number of times you can take it, um, I believe that you can take the test uh, three times. I believe you can take the test three times, and then after the third time, um, you need to get permission from a school to be able to take it again. Um, we will see all of your OAT scores. There's not ways to hide certain scores and let other scores be seen. Um, and so um, we, we often have students who are applying who have taken the test more than once, and that's okay. Um, we consider the, the top OAT score that you have as um, your official score. Do writing intensive courses count as English? Another good question, and, and yes. So long as there's some sort of proof, you know, a course description, or maybe it says it in the title of the class, what have you, if you have proof that it is a writing intensive class, yes, we will count that as English. Question, I have already graduated. Would it be better to go back and take biochemistry and statistics? Um, if you have not taken those classes, then yes, you will need to. So prerequisite courses are, are mandatory. Um, if you, I'm not entirely sure if you've taken those classes, not, or, or you have, and maybe you need to improve your score. So if it's a situational question like that, you can reach out to me and we can talk it through. Um, but generally speaking, yes, if you have not taken biochemistry and statistics, you would need to take those uh, at some point in time. Um, again, you don't necessarily need to take, take those particular classes before you apply, but before you would start the program. Okay, I have a psychology minor, so I have taken many upper level psychology classes. Would those count towards social science? Yes, so if you have psychology classes in addition to the Psych 101, 100 or, or entry level psychology, basic psychology, yes, we would accept those to the other social sciences. 
do we accept AP credit from high school? Um, yes, we do accept AP credit. We do also accept online classes. Uh, we recommend taking all your prerequisite courses in person, especially the sciences and especially labs, but we will accept online classes. Okay, so are there any other questions out there? I'll give it a, a few moments to see if, if y'all have any other questions. Those are all really excellent. And more questions. And again, I encourage you, if you have specific questions um, about your situation, you can reach out to me at admissions at sco.edu or give me a call. Um, if you want to schedule a campus visit, similarly, reach out to me. We can get something on the schedule for you. Otherwise, I wish you all the best of luck. And thank you for joining me in this webinar today. I hope to see you in future webinars and encourage you to join us for the ASCO virtual fair in June. All right, guys, that brings me to the end. Um, thanks once again.